Hello, great souls. So good to be with you today. Welcome to our Satsang Talk, Reflections on Autobiography of a Yogi. Let's begin together with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters of Kriya Yoga, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yogteshwar, and Paramahansa Yoganandaji, saints of all religions, we humbly bow to you now. Friend and guide, Swami Kriyananda, help us to tune in to the power of these pages, to receive the gifts that are offered here, to draw upon this grace for our own journey of awakening and to share with all as we have received the divine light, the divine joy, the divine love that is freely offered to us. Om. Peace. Amen. Okay, so we are uh, we continue with chapter 21. We visit Kashmir. Last week, I thought we might get through half the chapter. And as it turned out, I'm not sure we ever left page one. <laughs> so we never know for those who've been following these talks. And, you know, it's, uh, we just go with, uh, I go with the spirit of uh, what's offered that day. And uh, calling, just looking for, there's so much treasure in each chapter. And I really never know when I begin a talk what exactly we will talk about. So, um, yeah, again, there's so much in this chapter. We talked a lot last week about karma and, you know, this journey of understanding our karma and how, in one sense, what Yogananda has said is that only a master can know for us, uh, for anyone, what our karma really is. It's, it isn't something that we are privy to, to understand. So we work more with the principles of karma and the teachings about karma, but we are able to perceive, if we're open to it, a sense of intuitive understanding about our karma. There's a phrase in Ananda that's often repeated with two tones. So the phrase is, why is this happening? And you know, one tone can be just exasperated. Why is this happening? Which is not a sign. It's it's not within that tone. I don't really have any receptivity to why it's happening. I you know, it happens. We get frustrated. I get frustrated. Uh, but another way of practicing to receive information about why it's happening is to ask with curiosity. Why is this happening? And that can go pretty quickly. It can go from, why is this happening? To, oh, there's that phrase. <laughs> so let me pause and uh, take a few breaths and ask on a deeper level, why is it happening? Why? Um, so what I have found, and I think I mentioned this last week, that has guided me very well in my journey is this this idea, I felt it, it came to me early on in my spiritual life, that what I need to know, what's useful for me to know, I'll know. It'll come to me one way or another. Intuitive understanding or someone will speak the information to me. Somehow or another, I'll receive the information I need to know. And if I don't need to know, I won't. I just won't. I won't know. I, I can pray about it. I can ask for insight. Why is this happening? But if it's not useful for me, I will not know. It'll just be a mystery. And I've had the experience where sometimes it was about timing. I did eventually get an answer to a question, but I wasn't ready for the answer. I just that I needed actually a maturity and a life experience for the answer to land in a way that would be um, helpful. And so there was, that has happened to me where I did get the answer, but I just didn't get it until I was ready to receive it. Other time, yeah, so that's just what I can say about that. Um, there's more I can say about that, but I'm, I'm feeling, I just wanna kind of listen for 
I think the principle itself is enough rather than go into um, example in this moment. I'll circle back to it if it feels right. So part of what's talked about in this chapter that's interesting, right? It, it, it's, uh, it stood out to me. Yogananda is talking about the splendor of Kashmir and he describes it in rich ways. I mean, it, it, it's captivating as I was reading it. I, I feel transported there. He's describing these um, immense gardens of riotous, riotous with color, roses, of a dozen hues, snapdragons, lavender, pansies, popsies. I mean, he just goes on to describe this landscape that's extraordinary. The other thing that he describes is how what he's seeing reminds him of all these other magnificent places on the globe. And it's really something to see how many places he traveled to. So, um, he talks about uh, Scotland and England and Denver and Mexico and the Grand Canyon and Col uh, Colorado and Alaska and Yellowstone. I just started to highlight the many different places and he's using examples for each one. This reminded me of that. This was similar to that. It's powerful on many levels, but one of the levels that's powerful is um, it is said that wherever a master has visited, their consciousness remains. So I feel that within all of his travels, you know, this extraordinary blessing of the entire globe. Now a master would be able to do that anyway. They don't have to travel there physically to bring blessing. Nevertheless, there is, it is true that is a teaching that when they have been somewhere physically, their consciousness remains there. And it's one of the reason we go on spiritual pilgrimage. We go to places where the masters and the saints have lived because we can feel those vibrations. Sisi is one of those extraordinary places. One of my sister-in-laws who identifies herself, um, I try to remember how she said it, but it's a somewhat humorous way, but her way of identifying herself is someone who would not be sensitive to those energies at all. And she made a point of telling me, even I felt um, that divine presence in Assisi. She said it was undeniable. And she was saying to me, and you know me, I wouldn't feel something like that. <laughs> and I had been to Assisi, so that's why she was telling me, which it's so elevated. Like the presence of St. Francis, in my experience, is everywhere. I remember being with a friend. We had gone on a, a sp spiritual pilgrimage with Ananda. And she said to me at one point, you just feel in the hills the joy of God. Like the, the hills are just filled with joy. They are. As soon as she said that, I said, yeah, that's exactly what I feel. And the town, um, everything about it, I highly recommend it. If you ever have a chance to go there. It's, uh, and we have an Ananda Center there. So if you're traveling there, I also recommend uh, checking out the Ananda community there. It's a, it's, it's a community, they don't live all, in many of our Ananda communities, we're all in um, a similar geographic location, like in Palo Alto and Mountain View, we live in what's called an urban ashram, and it's an apartment building, right? So we're all on the same grounds. But the thing about community is you don't have to live there to be part of it. We have friends who are part of this community who live nearby and they're still very much a part of the community. That's similar in Assisi. Assisi doesn't have a central location for living. So people are sprinkled about nearby and uh, friends and uh, guru bhais will live together or near each other. So this idea that, uh, and Yogananda was there too in Assisi. So that saints, Swami Kriyananda was there and spent time there. It's it's really something to go to these places where the saints and masters have been and to give yourself an opportunity back to this idea of receptivity um, to receive the blessings that are offered in those places. So it, it was striking to me. I, I knew that Yogananda had traveled a lot, but as I was reading through all the different places he mentioned, um, it was impressive, to say the least. So that was just something to mention. And the other um, thing within this chapter that's talked about 
which links to the previous chapter. So for those who read it or heard the talk, in the previous chapter, we do not visit Kashmir. Yogananda is healed miraculously from Asiatic cholera. And really, it's only a few days after that healing that they then do visit Kashmir. Well, it's interesting. After the trip is basically completed, certainly for Yogananda, he goes back to college and Sri Yukteswar stays. Sri Yukteswar mentions to him as he's departing, um, there's a chance that I may leave this earth. So he says that to Yogananda, which is very um, concerning naturally to Yogananda. And he pleads with him, please don't leave. Please don't leave your body. And um, Sri Yukteswar says, okay, he, he, he hears that. But it, as it turns out, um, Yogananda receives a telegram that Sri Yukteswar is dangerously ill. And what happens, what Yogananda tells us, is that Sri Yukteswar takes on the karma of a few of the devotees who had stayed, remained on the trip with him. And then he goes on, Yogananda, to talk about how this can happen with masters that it is a level of mastery that saints possess and masters possess to be able to take on the illnesses and the karma of others. It does, he makes a point of saying it's not required that they get sick. So if they take the disease into their body, if they take the karma into their own life, it can speed up the healing for the devotee. What's interesting um, Asha's talked about this quite a bit with regard to Swami Kriyananda, and I've heard others um, who spent many years with him also speak to this. But one time Asha asked him directly, are you taking on the karma? Is that what's happening? Because Swami was very sick throughout um, most of his adult life. Certainly early days of Ananda, not so much, but then uh, for many, many years, he was very ill and in his physical body, not in his spiritual consciousness. One of my favorite quotes, it's, uh, there's a book that Asha put together in Divine Friendship as we've known him about Swami Kriyananda. And one of my favorite uh, letters about that is a time when his, I think she was a dental hygienist who, tra who visited she accompanied him to a dentist visit where they took a medical history and they asked, have you had this? Have you had this, right? Arthritis, yes. Hip replacement, yes. Heart disease, um, heart surgery, yes. Cancer, yes. Diabetes, yes. And goes through this unbelievable list. Yes, 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 yes. On the bottom, how would you rate your overall health? Excellent. And I just love that. I keep it highlighted because it is such a clear reminder that this chapter is talking about they're not related to each other. Boy, it can really feel like they're related. I think that's one of the most challenging things of moving through the material realm and practicing these spiritual teachings is how much the body impacts our consciousness. It's one of the things we work with in yoga postures. Because it does, there's a lot we can do to help our consciousness by working with the body. All of that being said, though, it's very important to remember I am not my body. Because, you know, well, for a lot of reasons that's important, but one of the reasons it's important is um, the deeper reality of who we are. The more that I remind myself I'm not my body, the more I'm able to open up more sensitively to the truth, which is a place of inner power. So Yogananda called it an inner abode, an inner oasis. Uh, thinking of Asha again, she said when she heard that, that first time she heard that within each of us is a portable paradise, she thought, great. And she just, she goes, I don't know why I came up with this, but she thought it would be about five years it would take her to um, fully access that portable paradise and live in it all the time. 50 years later, <laughs> she said, uh, she has not fully accessed that portable paradise 24-7, uh, but clearly her life has transformed in many, many ways. And she will say about herself, I mean, she sees the improvement. She sees the change. She can, she can see it. I, I, I don't know the change, I just know Asha. And um, what a clear, pure channel she is for me in my life. 
of these teachings. But I appreciate the humor and I appreciate her saying, you know, we get these ideas. Mainly what it comes down to is that it's not required that I have complete self-mastery and self-realization to receive the benefit of the teachings. It's a journey and oftentimes it's incremental. So a little bit of change, a little bit of change. We were talking today earlier in a yoga class about, you know, just a little bit of change makes, it's a big difference. And so part of it is training my mind to be open and receptive to those little changes. So this idea of um, talking about the body, and that's a lot of what happens in this chapter, is he's, he, another piece to it that Yogananda mentions is how we very often confuse physical health with spiritual elevation. We assume, he said, many people assume that um, a master would always be in perfect health. And so, uh, but it's not true. A master isn't necessarily in perfect health. He could be, but it may not be what is necessary for that lifetime. Perhaps he is taking on the karma of other devotees and working that out for him. What is said about masters is they only do the will of God. So in this moment, I'm reminded of Jesus and his life. And um, at the very end of his life, when Pontius Pilate, for those of you who know the story of Christ, is saying to him, I have the power to take your physical life, right? And he's kind of saying to him, don't you want to give me information that might allow me to not do this? You know, if you could just answer these few questions. And Jesus said to him, you don't have that power. <laughs> that power to take my life comes from the universe. That comes from God, right? And, and really, so he's saying, you might do it, but it's not because you have any power over my life. You don't have any power over my life. And that, with the master, so they live in, things can happen. And of course, it was so confusing for his disciples that he would die physically. Right? That just made no sense at all to them. If you have the power of the universe, why would that be meaningful? Why would that be a good idea? Yogananda touches upon it in this chapter. Again, in part of how a master can take on the karma. So, you know, in Christian teaching, Jesus died for our sins. That's often said a lot. And what Yogananda said is that he did take on the sins of his direct disciples. And his, the power of Christ, that power, the power of a master, absolutely expiates our karma. It can. If we are receptive to the master's grace and we call upon that grace and we align our lives with that grace, our karma will be transformed. It will be mitigated. It will be transcended. It will be dissolved. It will be. And there's a part for us to do in it. And that's what the teachings, all of these stories within all of the stories are messages for how to work with these teachings. And I've, I've said it before, but I'm always appreciative that Yogananda gives us a, you know, a ringside view through his relationship with his guru, right? He, he, he plays for us that our own role in a spiritual life. So when he pleads with his master, please don't die, I need you. I need you to be here in physical form. Sri Yukteswar, acquiesces to that. He says, okay, he will stay. He ends up getting very, very sick, but he doesn't die. He doesn't leave the body. And if it was right for him to do, he would have, even if his disciple asked him not to. Um, they always follow God's will. But sometimes the master will say, God has spoken uh, to me through you. Right? So uh, there's this later in the chapter, there's a moment where Babaji says that. He's going to leave his body. And his sister says, you know, do not leave your physical body. Babaji's known as the deathless saint in that he materializes and dematerializes from his physical form. That's clear mastery of the physical body. I, I don't know why he was going to leave completely, but his sister asks him not to. And his response is, the Divine Mother has spoken through you. And so I will not. I will not permanently leave my body. Um, 
Very interesting, but a master can know that. They can know karma and they understand what's being asked of them. They live in samadhi. So Yogananda talks about how um, we can get confused at times of what does a saint look like? What does a master look like? What do we imagine? And how is that relevant to our own life? Like, why does that matter? Well, part of it, I can say for myself, is being able to discern a teacher. Why, why is that meaningful? And part of what he's saying here is that someone can have radiant health. It doesn't make them a master. <laughs> they might have radiant health. In our culture, we really celebrate radiant health, physical health. I don't know if I'd call it radiant health, but we, f we celebrate, certainly in the Western culture, looking good. That is, a, and so if someone has health, I wanna check my time, if someone has health, um, we tend to elevate them, right? There's something very special about that physical health. Yoga, and, and Yogananda talks about it in this chapter, it's said that it, it is our duty to take care of our body. It's very important that we take care of our health, but not to mistake that with it somehow translating into spiritual consciousness. The, you know, we have the body we have, we're where we are. Sometimes when we come onto the spiritual path or even on the spiritual path, you know, you get to a point, I remember Diksha McCord, who's up at the Expanding Light, she was talking to us about the yamas and niyamas. And she was saying, which is true about them, they're laid out in a linear fashion, but we don't really practice them in a linear way, right? You just, you, you attend to whichever one is in front of you to attend on, or that might be, um, you, it either is coming to you or you feel drawn to work on that. The, but the idea that she was saying about our spiritual life is, again, not to be confused in thinking that we master all of it at once. We kind of work on a little area. And so she was actually talking about the physical body. She said, you know, one person, they might really be working on that and they might gain a lot of ground in that area and be doing very well. It doesn't mean they've mastered this area over here and vice versa. So part of it is not to judge others. <laughs> not to be looking at what anybody else is doing. Just pay attention to your own life and to recognize any effort that you make, this is something Krishna says uh, in the Gita, that is not lost. So every, any amount of effort that we make in our spiritual life, there's an eternal quality to that that is lasting for us, which is very good news. But the other thing is to be able to recognize what is a true sign of spiritual enlightenment? Or, yeah, what is a true sign of that? And I always appreciate that Swami Kriyananda brings it down into bite-sized pieces. The practice of kindness, the practice of compassion, the ability, he said, a sign of spiritual maturity is the ability to make room for other people's realities. It's not that we have to be, have mastery completely in that. He has a long list to evaluate our spiritual progress and, and most of that list says, I'm willing to, I'd like to, I have a desire to. Not that I've done it, not that I'm kind all the time or compassionate all the time, but I'd like to be. Wow, that's pretty amazing. That, but he said, that is an indication of the direction of spiritual aspiration, that you'd like to be. That, that that matters to you. And so in many ways, take comfort in that, be reassured in that. And also it's, it's always this practice of going deeper and deeper in our awareness. So Yogananda points out physical health, the saints don't necessarily have it. Yeah, some of the great saints, they didn't have physical health. St. Francis for one had many illnesses, but it didn't affect his consciousness. Um, Yogananda, there's a story of his life where um, he was, they were putting in, if you've ever been to Mount Washington, which he talks about also in this chapter, he has a vision of Mount Washington. And when he saw Mount Washington, which is the headquarters for Self-Realization Fellowship, um, when he saw it in person, he knew it was the same vision he had in Kashmir uh, of this 
of this building. But when they were on the grounds, they had a cement well they were building. And the well, thousands of pounds apparently, someone, it slipped when they were moving it and it fell on his foot and um, injured it seriously. And then Yogananda used that as a moment to demonstrate the power of transcending the physical body. And so he asked the disciples there, the, the students, to look at his foot. And he pointed down and he said, when I focus here, I feel pain. And his foot would swell up. It looked horrible. He had just really seriously injured it. He said, when I focus here, there is no pain. And as soon as he put his attention here, the foot went back to normal size. No sign of injury. When I focus here, his foot swelled up. And, you know, the disciples were like, what am I seeing? Mastery of the physical body. Mastery of the physical body. So the masters make decisions based on divine will of how to work with their physical body. And the teaching here, all of the teachings are telling us, this is our destiny. So we have this same destiny. We have within us the capacity of complete self-mastery of self-realization and it and every incremental step that we take towards that is awakening this uh, understanding of inner freedom so we hold the highest bar of that's where i'm headed and it's important to keep seeing where we're headed and then to come back into right now and what's my truth and my reality right now? So how do I hold both of those in a meaningful way? And one of them is highlighted here, not to confuse physical health with spiritual realization. You might not have it. I might not have it. Yeah, it's easier to meditate if you do have it. It's easier, but it's not required. And I just am grateful for that message, deeply grateful. One of our teachers, Ananta, said, when you hear that, that you're not the body, oh, you're younger, you're healthy, you're vibrant. All right, I'm not the body. Because when you get older, you really appreciate it. <laughs> and he's a lovely teacher and full of humor. And it's true. I appreciate it more and more as I age. But the idea here is an indication of the grace of the masters and how it can help us how it can serve us, and also to just check out for ourselves when we're aligning with teachers and teachings, um, this deeper, I'm gonna call it for this moment, vibration of what they are sharing. Because the other point that he makes here, I'll wrap up with this, is that even eloquence of metaphysics, written eloquence, verbal eloquence, that doesn't mean mastery. Um, the thing that has guided me the most with teachers and with teachings, which is very in line with what we share at Ananda, again, back to this idea of vibration, is a resonance within myself and an uplifted quality after I have been with that teacher or I've spent time with those teachings. The first time I read autobiography, I read a cha I, basically a paragraph at a time. I'd read a paragraph, I'd close the book, and I could sense, I could sense a power in it. This has been true for me with all the teachers at Ananda, with all the teachings, and not just to Ananda, right? other spiritual paths. I can sense what Yogananda said, that truth is universal. There's many paths to um, get us to this self-realization. And every time I touch something that's real, like that, I feel it within myself. And sometimes it looks really different than I expected. And I think that's why one of the reasons he's talking about this here. Like, don't be deceived. Go deeper within yourself as you move through life. Last time, tune in intuitively to understand why your life is unfolding the way that it is. What's being offered? What gifts are being presented to you? How can this grace of the masters support you in understanding it and moving through it and also dissolving or mitigating it for you? Right? So part of the practice here is there's one of our affirmations with calm faith I open to thy light. I think in these two chapters in particular, this invitation, these are the teachings, and I can practice being open to that. And in that practice and in that opening, I'm much more likely to tangibly receive it. 
So I'll offer that for you this week to in calm faith I open to thy light. Just open, see how calling consciously upon the master's grace might help you mitigate whatever it is you're traveling through, dissolve it completely perhaps, or give you the strength you need to walk through it. Okay, great souls. It's really good to be with you today. Wishing you a beautiful day and many blessings this week.